Maya Ardell, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. Did I pronounce your name right? Maya Ardell, absolutely. I mean, my real name, the <clears> one <throat> I was given when I was born, is Maria Paulus Doctor Ardell. Okay. Yeah, so you can say that if you like. But <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know what? I am going to ask you to do I'm going to ask you to teach me how to pronounce the name of the city or the village you were born in. Yeah, I was born in a small fishing town just below the Arctic Circle in Iceland, mm -hmm. and the name of the town is Siglifjordur. Okay, I'm going to try to say it. Siglifjordur. Very good. Was that close? Yes. Okay, and I actually, because I was like really curious about this village, I went to the internet, and is that, are these, is that it? Oh yeah, that's uh, Siglifjordur today. They've got the museum of, you see, the herring all disappeared. The herring disappeared? Yeah. Really? The, the herring disappeared. This is actually, it looks much sort of nicer and more prosperous than it did for a while. Oh, really? It became almost a ghost town when the herring disappeared. Oh, really? Um, so, but then what they started doing was having herring festivals, where they actually shipped herring in and everybody pretended that the herring was still there for oh, a, a no. weekend. Oh, and, no. um, and now they have fabulous museums to the herring days. My mother and father were in, her, in the herring fishing, because, fisheries because at night, You'd get a phone call, the boats are coming in, and you'd rush down to the harbour and you'd get the herring and you'd start salting and barreling the herring. And my father uh, worked in the factories and it was sort of the herring sludge that would turn into oil, that was all huh. part of how they made money. So was and they it made overfished? lots of money. Made oh, yeah. Money? Oh. yeah. So was it overfishing that eventually. No. What, what the herring just decided to swim somewhere else. Because they were getting caught. Yeah. I mean, the Icelanders knew how the fish lived in the ocean, you know, and, and in some ways you could say that there was overfishing coming from other countries because you, you don't want to be scooping up the fish when they're having their babies. You want to let them have the babies, let the babies grow. It's really quite simple. <laughs> let me see. Yes. Some of these places are like, <clears throat> I mean, some of them I'm sure are modernized, but they're, the, the big thing on the internet is about this church that apparently that you can see from everywhere. Are there any memories you have? How old were you? Well, I would go back and forth between Iceland and Scotland. I was quite little when my fa my father was a university student. Mm -hmm. And so he and mum would spend the summers working in Iceland to make some money. And then we would go back to uh, Edinburgh. He was a student in Edinburgh um, so that he could continue with his studies. So my memories of Siglufjörður are basically summers, the summers in Siglufjörður. My, my great uncle had the bakery. He, he, so that was always great. We started off by going to the bakery and eating as many cakes as we could. And then we'd spend the rest of the summer playing with our cousins in uh, Sigrefjörður. And there was also another town, Akureyri, where uh, we spent a lot of time. And we'd spend time on the farms in the, you know, in the countryside. So we had to milk the cows and feed the chickens. Right. So we were Icelandic, rural, small-town children, mm -hmm. speaking Icelandic. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, over a two, three-day period on the, sh on the ship back to Scotland, we became Scottish girls, my sister and I, Scottish kids, um, going to school in the sort of inner city of Scotland and trying to be as Scottish as we possibly could. So... As funny a, names. <laughs> with funny names. Um, as a child growing up, what were some of the foods that you ate? Well, that's interesting because we loved the Icelandic food. Mm -hmm. So um, when we would always get big boxes, big packages from Iceland to Scotland, especially around Christmas. Mm -hmm. So we'd get the smoked lamb. Which, which is, you don't get here. Smoked lamb is a very special Icelandic thing. We'd get the pickled whale's blubber. Okay. It, I re, my mouth waters when I talk of it. It mm. was delicious. It was cut into little chunks and you'd eat it with a fork. Okay. And, and we'd get small chunks of um, rotten shark, which was uh, buried, you'd, they'd catch shark and bury it in the black volcanic sand over a period of time until it was very, very high. Think the strongest cheese in the world and then mm. multiply that. Mm. And it was like ammonia going through your head when you'd eat it. Okay. So they still f really value that. It's like eating, you know, a really treasured thing. So that was, that's what we got. And we do the baking, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and the seasonal baking as well. Mm -hmm. um, so that was my favorite food as well as roast lamb. But Icelanders, of course, that's the big, the, the meat one day a week, fish, fish all week, meat one day a week. Mm -hmm. And it was always roast lamb. So in Scotland, we ate roast lamb too. That was my favorite. Yeah, yeah. Well, and well, of course, in Scotland, I don't think they're known for their culinary arts, but what were some of the things you could eat growing up in Scotland? Mince. Mince and tatties. Mince and tatties. <laughs> you get the yeah, minced, up, minced up meat, sometimes right. lamb, sometimes right. beef, until okay. it was a sort of a porridgey looking thing. Okay. And you have a whole pile of tatties with the, on the side and uh -huh. peas. 
That was, lo that was lo lovely. I loved that. That was school lunches. Uh, we, actually, I ate all my lunch at the school lunches. And, of course, you must have had haggis. I love haggis. Okay. A well-made haggis is magnificent. It's got nice yeah. spices in it, and it's all, the, it's all the bits of the sheep that people don't like to look at. Mm -hmm. um, and that reminds me, actually, one of my favorite foods in Iceland is the sheep's head. And they actually sell the heads okay. in the supermarket. Mm -hmm. And mum would get the heads, and she'd say to the go to the butchers in Scotland, could you give me the sheep's heads? Because they didn't eat them in Scotland. Mm -hmm. And then she'd bring it home, and she'd stick the poker in the fire, and she'd burn off all the wool off the, off the sheep's face. Okay. Right? Yeah. And then boil it, and then we'd eat them cold. And there was still the eye and the ears and stuff, and you sort of gouge out everything. And, eat it with mashed potatoes and turnip. So to this day, mm -hmm. the smell of burning wool makes my mouth water. Okay. I, you, you know, my heritage is Jamaica. In Jamaica, they've got some interesting foods, but that mm. takes the cake. Saltfish and ackee. I oh, love yeah. that. Oh, yeah. It's, it's really yeah. good. But sheep's head, I'll have to try that. Yes, I'll, I'll introduce you to sheep's head. Do you season it with anything? Or do you... you don't have to. It's delicious. Okay. Yeah. You have to peel uh, off the gum around the teeth. Gouge okay. out the ear. Ears have so much fat in them. I'm sure it's yeah. delicious. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, I'm just like, <laughs> sheep's head, uh, can you get sheep's head here in Toronto? Well, you can ask the butcher not to throw it away, but okay. no, we usually just, you know, if I'm in Iceland, I'll pick up the sheep's heads, and they usually have the wool all burned off. Mm -hmm. You know, in the supermarket, you just get half a face, because you don't put the whole head on, you get half the head, you get one eye, one ear. That sounds, I'm Half sorry. a nose. But I, okay, I've got to try it. <laughs> that sounds amazing. That sounds, of course, you have to love... Coming to Canada and explaining to people, you know, the delicacies of sheep's head uh, and the reactions that you get, uh, you know, you must mm -hmm. love the, the way in which Canadians react to that. People still talk about when I gave them rotten shark. <laughs> okay. You have to chase it down with brennivin, which is a very, very strong, hard li Icelandic liquor, sort of like aquavit. Okay. It's a bit more vicious than aquavit, so you okay. do the rotten shark and slug it. And that I'm in. Cures diseases. Okay, uh, I, I believe you. <laughs> I'll have to try the rotten shark and uh, what's it called? Um, a brennivin. Brennivin, okay. Yes. All right, I'm in. Okay. Yes. So, growing up, um, as you said, you know, your father, um, he liked to study. So he became a philosopher, is that correct? Right? Yes, he started off studying classics and stuff, and then he fell in love with moral philosophy. Hmm. And he was a great philosopher. He wrote books and uh, brought up, brought up um, ideas that I used in my work, actually, mm -hmm. as a, as a theatre director and a playwright, particularly, because his ethics, his ethical exploration was so fascinating. You know, one of his, my favourite papers of his is, Does Anybody Ever Deserve to Suffer? Hmm. And uh, he wrote a book called Passion and Value. So how do you balance, you know, value, values with the passions? Hmm. If, I think we have so to acknowledge the passions first, recognize, uh, recognize what they, what they truly are. are. And then the now, other and thing my father would say, which I love, he said, we are mirrors to each other. I only see myself in you, Andrew, right now. You are, you are, you are who I am right now. Right. And that's wonderful for us as actors and as playwrights to recognize that we are mirrors to each other. And sympathetic imagination, which he coined that phrase, which means imagine yourself to be the other person. Mm. Don't just imagine what it would feel like if you had a sore, you know, a headache like the other person, but imagine myself to be Andrew with the headache. Mm. You're very proud of your dad. He was an amazing, amazing man, an amazing philosopher, and a small town, old fashioned guy from the north of Iceland. Mm. So he was never one of those kind of Ponzi intellectuals. Right, right, yeah, yeah. always down to earth. Mm -hmm. And what about your mom? Mum was considered to be one of the most beautiful girls in Akureyri, which is the, the other town that mm -hmm. um, we spent a lot of time in in Iceland, and my father went to school there. So I think he felt very lucky to land her. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, she came from a large family, and all the kids' names started with the letter H. I don't know. I mean, I have, so much of my playwriting has been inspired by mm -hmm. my parents. My mother, in many ways, is my muse. Mm -hmm. And so when she, uh, when Dad landed her, mm -hmm. um, they, uh, ca they decided just they should get married because they're going to go to Scotland, and they heard that people in Scotland get married before they have children and stuff. It's not wasn't an Icelandic thing particularly. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so they uh, got married and. Um, she came to Scotland not knowing any English, and she learned English, and she's a very enterprising woman. She's an artist, mm. a potter, and uh, but she was a very enterprising woman. She had all sorts of wonderful ways of keeping Dad studying and, 
and uh, keeping you know keeping it all together around us little girls. We all we all lived in one room, like student digs, you know. Right. It's just all four of us in one little room. I remember a mouse running over my face at one point. When, oh one, of, one, of, one of the places we stayed. Right. <laughs> and what were some of the things that she did to keep everybody together? Were there? She basically managed every single practical detail. My father was an intellectual, was terribly absent-minded. I mean, he was really sort of, he adored the children and all the rest of it, but, but his head was in clouds, in those kind of, you know, dreamy, philosophical clouds. So my mother, she sewed all our clothes. She made all our clothes. We were the best dressed kids in that little inner city mm -hmm. Scottish school. Yeah. Um, she uh, invented meals that looked like food. Like she, she, at one point, she gave us slabs of turnip as the kind of the main, you know, the meat part of the dish. <laughs> <laughs> like, right, yeah. And she also um, raised money. She knitted Icelandic sweaters and sold them. And she started a little company shipping. Icelandic horse skins from, you know, for the people put on their floors from Iceland. I mean, she was very enterprising. I see in you a perfect marriage between the two. Uh, your father's philosophy and your mother's being enterprising, is that correct? Mm -hmm. I'd like to think so. Mm -hmm. And also, my mother, um, in a sense, she gave, uh, gave me permission never to grow up in a way. Because despite her incredible practicality and her amazing survival and you know organizational skills, she has the imagination of a child. Right. And my father was a beautiful singer, so I, fortunately I gained, I got his, I got his musicality too. Mm -hmm. And um, my whole family has a particular physical trait: is when they sing or they make up stories, they they, they get they cry. My mm -hmm. father always had these watery eyes when he sang. It was so nice. Really? Yeah.